Hi everybody, uh, I'm here with Smart and once again on this stage, we are here a year ago or so and the world's kind of the same but very different. So, I think... It's certainly, certainly changed. It's certainly changed. It's interesting Smart is always a total honour, so we're going to spend the next half an hour or so digging into some of the biggest issues facing the industry today. Uh, on a kick-off, Martin, at Cannes last week, week before, you said something very interesting. That was that the likes of Netflix and Meta and sure. Google were there to meet the CTOs or mm. CIOs of their clients, not the CMO. So have marketers lost their power? Well, so first of all, Netflix really wasn't there. I mean, Netflix has gone, is going to um, an advertising model, which you and I have discussed before. And I think it certainly makes sense given the, the competitive framework they have, but probably Netflix, if they proceed with their plans, uh, will be there uh, in some profusion next year. I and mean, the big presence this year was around Amazon, I guess, the new presence. I mean, Amazon are always there, but they were there big time if you walked along the Croisette or past the Palais and to the, the port. So. Um, no, I, I, don't, I don't think the CMOs have lost power, but they, in a way, I suppose they have to share power. I'm going to see one client uh, later this week in Europe where they're, they're going through digital marketing transformation in Europe in 27 markets. And that means that there are three functions involved, marketing, sales, and IT. So I think there are three, uh, any CEO or CFO or chief procurement officer uh, probably has to involve in marketing transformation as we define it, at least three functions internally. The marketing function, so like the client I'm gonna see on, on Friday, the, the head of sales is involved, the head of marketing is involved and the IT function is involved. So the three comes together. Now, the, I think you said to me that you were talking to somebody here, a consultant, who worked at one of the, um, the tech um, providers. And, and the markets in which S4 competes, uh, or, or the competitors which compete with, there are really sort of three layers. There's the specialists who might do content or data and analytics and digital media. There are bits of the holding companies, not the holding companies as a whole. It might be their more um, contemporary, more aggressive, uh, probably smaller units that, that, that can compete. And then you have the, the consulting companies, I mean, dominated by an Accenture uh, because they are the, 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 the huge one. They're the elephant or the aircraft carrier, if you like. Uh, and then you have uh, Globant, probably by size, then Endava and EPAM and ThoughtWorks and Perficient, which is a much smaller and CNIT, which is a Brazilian-based one. So there are many others in, in the private unlisted sector, but they, are, they attack the, the CIO and CTO. The, the first two layers that I mentioned, namely the specialists and the, the bits of the holding companies that tend to attack the marketing and sales function. Uh, so you have to bring all three things together. So I don't need a diminution of power. I mean, we're at a pivotal, in my view, we're in a pivotal moment. I got up this morning and Merrill Lynch are downgrading all the holding companies quite significantly for next year by as much as 10 to 15% on earnings. So, you know, can actually was sort of a strange moment. I mean, people had signed up and contracted to can and booths and boats and, and locations six months previously. If we were having this discussion, let's say in December of last year or in January of this year, we wouldn't have gone through the five or so things that we can run through, you know, starting with withdrawal of COVID and stimulus and finishing with extended Chinese lockdowns and covering inflation and the war and in uh, hike in interest rates. We wouldn't really be focused on that. When people book CAN, they weren't focused on that. When they turned up at CAN, that's the big thing. And so Q2, the, we'll see the reporting season shortly, Q2 will look, I think, okay. My guess is it's probably surprised to the upside because every CEO of a very listed company wants to look good. So they, they undercall it and, and they over deliver, at least against the expectation. But then the focus is going to be laser like on what's going to happen in the second half of the year and what's going to happen in 23. 
Uh, can Mark Pritchard uh, quite rightly said, you know, I I'm going to double down, I being him, going to double down or double up uh, on marketing spend. But interesting, a statistic in the last presentation which said 40% of people expected their budgets to remain the same or lower. And there is going to be, my view, in my view, huge pressure. Uh, you know, the number of people here uh, and at this conference, however many, 17,000 registered, re uh, registered entrants, the majority of them are managing brands or budgets, marketing budgets, and they are going to be under pressure. The other thing I would say is that pressure is going to be greater on analog than digital. There is great statistical data to show that even when GDP growth slows, spend on digital grows. So if you looked at the US, if you looked at EMEA, in fact, as a result of CAN, I, we did regression analysis with a uh, major consumer uh, package goods company and, and uh, a, a guy who does a lot of analytical work in that area. And what's really interesting, we've been looking at the last week or so at the data in the US, the data in Europe, and the data globally. And it quite clearly shows there's a very strong correlation between GDP and growth and spend as a whole. But the, the correlation with digital spend is at much, much higher levels. So our expectation post the slowdown analysis that everybody, you know, whether it's a recession or a slowdown that everybody's talking about, is that digital this year will grow something like 10 to 15 percent and will go, grow at that rate. And digital is running at the moment 60 to 65 percent of the global media market and grow at that rate until at least 2024, 20, 25. And advertising as a proportion of GDP is going to rise. But it's not going to rise because of analog. It's going to rise because all the digital components, you know, as the last speaker said as well, you know, the, the, not, not, I wasn't quite in agreement that necessarily the number of platforms are going to get greater, but the number of product offerings by the, uh, 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 so probably a finite number of platforms is going to increase. So complexity is going to increase. And our view is digital will continue to grow uh, at a significantly higher rate than analog, which is the problem that the holding companies have because still two thirds of their business is analog. So let me ask a question sort of for people in this audience. A lot of people sitting here are hoping one day to be bought by you or something very similar. So you've talked about 10% growth, 10 to 50% growth in digital. We what buy, do you were we doing? Merge do? with people. We, of course, we you merge. merge. I forget, sorry. Slight difference. It's about I, it. I think in the introduction to talk about acquire, we, we ban the A word and we have the M word. Like merge, merge, merge yeah. smart and sorry. So, someone who wants to merge with you in this audience, what should they be doing to get fit? Well, they're, 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 you know, first of all, you have to think about what we're trying to do. We're trying to, to, to develop a new model and disrupt the old. So there's, there's a disruptor piece here. So you, you, you have to be a little bit of a missionary um, in, in terms of trying to change the model, which has been around for 70 years. I mean, people go back to the 80s and Saatchi or whatever, but really you go back an Omnicom and the Big Bang that Omnicom did in the mid-1980s. Mid but it goes back to Marion Harper and the 1970s and IPG, or maybe the 1950s and I, IPG. It's been around for 70 years. So it has to change. It's not fit for purpose anymore. And then there are four elements to it, uh, to our model. One is digital only, or certainly focus. Secondly, data-driven in an iterative model, you know, what we call the holy trinity of data driving the creation of content on a, as the previous speaker to, uh, talked about, on a personalized basis using now increasingly first party data and the signals from the platforms in an iterative way. So you don't produce necessarily a perfect ad. You might produce one and a half million potential ads. You might use 50 to 70,000 of them, but they're ta tailored, it's personalization at scale. Third one is we go to market as faster, better, cheaper. Faster is about agility. Better is about understanding the digital ecosystem. And cheaper is probably the wrong word. It's more efficiency, which in an inflation world, world, world is going to be more important. And then we have a unitary structure. One brand trying not to create verticals inside, very difficult inside any organization of more than one person, to create verticals inside them, but bring them together. So that's the background. And then there are four sort of attributes. One is top line growth, which you would expect given those four characteristics 
And given what I said about the difference between analog and digital growth, you'd expect that. Margins, 20% plus. Uh, thirdly, management ownership. That's pretty key. A lot of companies have increasingly PE-owned, VC-owned. That's not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but we prefer management to have skin, skin in the game. And the problem with listed companies is there's a separation usually between ownership and control. What, to my mind, um, signifies an independent agency. You could have a very large independent agency if management owned or controlled the company, or owned a significant part of the company or controlled it. So that's the third thing. And the final thing is no technological obsolescence exposure, meaning we're a service business. You know, we created this uh, venture fund called S4S Ventures with Stanhope run by Sanya Partello, who used to work with me at WPP and with Scott Spirit at WPP. And we're, we haven't made our first investment. We're on the cusp of actually making our first investment. That's going to invest in tech because we don't, you know, our people are really good at sussing out where the tech developments are. So, you know, I say Epic Games and the Fortnite technology, the Unreal Engine would be a good example. The Metaverse, uh, Apple's TV, uh, Apple, Apple's uh, advertising platform. Those are three recent developments where our people have been really hot in terms of identifying the next shiny thing. And we can use that knowledge, I think, to identify tech. But it's not for S4, because S4 isn't about tech, tech it's about services. We have 9,000 people now in 32 countries. It used to be 33, but the obvious one has gone. Uh, Russia, uh, we're now down, down to 32. And you know, those 9,000 people are in 57 locations. And therefore, they get a very good understanding of where the puck is going to, to use the Gretzky. Not where it is now, but where it's going to. You mentioned the metaverse. You and I have talked previously about yeah. the metaverse. And it dominated Cannes. It's dominating Madfest this year. It's dominating discussions in the headlines. So the metaverse, is it, is it overhyped? Or is it something the brand should be paying um, more attention to? Well, look, uh, declare an interest. We work very closely with, with the protagonists of the, the metaverse, the, 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 the original protagonists. But it's going to be much more competitive for Meta and Facebook than it was in its traditional... You know, you could argue that in its traditional areas, the big competition, obviously, was around Google and Amazon, and then the, on the East, Tencent, Alibaba, and now TikTok and, or ByteDance. It's going to be much more competitive for them in the in the metaverse. Um, you know, they may have named the area, but but it is you know. So, Nvidia, Roblox. I mean, all the companies, Intel. I mean, all these companies, in one way or another, are going to get heavily involved. Apple, Microsoft, with its move with Activision, if that goes through, which I think probably is more likely than not, you're going to see huge competition in the area. Now, to put it in perspective, where it may have been overhyped is not in its long-term importance or significance as another channel, because it is another channel of communication, which is really important. But it may have been overhyped in sense of initial take-up. So take us as an example. We did $900 million of revenue last year. We're scheduled to do 1.2, 1.3 billion this year. Of that delta, that's the 300 to 400 million increase, I would say roughly 30 to 40 million dollars of revenue are coming from metaverse, identified metaverse. So it's about 10% of the increment, but of the overall figure, it's only 3 or 4%. So to get it into perspective, it's super important. So in Cannes, every conversation you had, you know, whether it was with the CIO or the CTO or the CMO or the CSO or people in those functions, you know, would at some stage or other, probably usually at the beginning, talk about metaverse and metaverse opportunities. Now, we've done heavy work for the NBA and Verizon. We've, we've streamed 56 games, I think it is, in three seasons, basketball games. So sports applications, huge. Music applications, we've done huge pop music concerts in the metaverse. We've done uh, some really interesting training and education initiatives in the metaverse. E-commerce applications. The training thing, by the way, is huge. So when you see, you know, the, the program that pilots, I mean, don't get worried because pilot, well, such, as many pilots as we have at the moment, 
they, they have to train physically, but they also train on the metaverse. And the program they do is quite extraordinary in terms of uh, its nature. So training and education, we talked to a big education company about, uh, the, actually based in Brazil. <coughs> they um, manufacture, if that's the right word, about half a million high school students and, and university students a year. And the metaverse applications are huge. The work from home applications are going to be huge. We already use it for our internal management meetings. You know, the headwear and, and the, the tolerance now to long meetings wearing the headwear is getting better and better, and there'll be some very significant developments. But it's, we're in the foothills here. I mean, maybe not even in the foothills. We're in the plain before the foothills. But it will be huge. But it's right to get excited about it. So I'm somewhat hesitant to say it's overhyped, although I have sort of indicated I think that is the case. Uh, but it's a very sexy area which people are really interested in. We're going to play. You know, we did, um, we launched a series for Netflix called Cielo Grande in, in Latin America on Roblox, on a Roblox game using the metaverse. So some hu really interesting, not a huge revenue project for us, but, but in terms of its in, you know, interest to our people and attracting good people and showing clients what we can do, uh, it's really important. Okay, let's mention people. Let's talk more about people. So obviously yeah. the, the people drive this industry. And you and I talked at this stage before and at other stages about the diversity problem in our industry, of which there is one. I just look at my notes here to make sure I get the figures right. But the latest IPA census said that uh, one employed from a non-white background had increased, a 3% increase. Uh, but the pay gap had increased. So it's now 21.2% a pay gap, mm. an ethnic pay gap. Mm. So obviously diversity is something we're failing to crack. Mm. So how do you see these latest figures? How stocks probably? Look, look I, I, it goes back to the assassination of um, Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. I mean, we thought things, I'm old enough to remember that uh, and to, to be marked psychologically and mentally by it. And I remember then we said things were going to change. And, you know, after the murder of George Floyd, I think we have seen significant change. But again, I'm somewhat hesitant because we said that many years ago and it didn't happen. I think it is happening, actually. I think the, well, from what we see, so of our 9,000 people, uh, about, uh, let's say, 6,000 roughly, are in the Americas, so North and South America. Um, what we saw in North America after the murder of George Floyd is a, an immediate sort of change. Um, the tech companies and the media companies didn't have very good diversity stats, particularly from a racial point of view. And we started to see that. So a lot of the, the so-called digital wage inflation that we saw last year uh, was driven by, I, I think, parts of the economy trying to catch up on, on the area quite rightly. I mean, it wasn't because it had been mandated, <coughs> it, not, it not necessarily been quoted, and there's an argument for doing that, but it wasn't because of that. It was because people finally realized they had to do it. Now, if I look at S4, uh, we're gender diverse. You know, we look, we look good overall, probably more, me more women than men, actually, at the end of the day. But, you know, where we, where we lose out is at the senior levels, right? We, 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 where we see uh, it's only about a third of our senior leadership however you define that, is female. And that's just not acceptable. Now, we've, we've worked with the University College of Berkeley. We're in our second, we've just completed our second flight of that uh, to try and deal with the issues. But they are very difficult issues that people in this audience and beyond know, and they will take time to deal with. So that's one thing. People of color, we're super good on that, in the sense 40% of our workforce. In the I should qualify this, in the, in the jurisdictions that we can get the data, because there are some jurisdictions that we can't get the data for legal reasons, but where we can, principally, let's say the US, North and South America and, and Europe or parts of Europe, you know, we, we, we do well on people of color, but we do particularly well on Hispanic and Asian American, not so much in the black community. That's an area we have to raise our game, if I can put it that way. So we've committed to, um, reflect the communities in which we work. And if you take America as an example, we're probably running at about 6% black at the moment. It 
On average in America, it's about 13, but if you're in New York, it's 25%. You're in California, it's about six or seven. So we'd be okay, in inverted commas, in, in California, but we're not okay in New York, so we have to raise our game there. So I would say those are the two things. See no female leadership. Um, for the, for the, the question around the black community, you know, we've instituted this internship program. We're small scale, but we started with the historically black universities like Howard, and we've now morphed to the uh, US high schools. So we've actually started the uh, black in internship program at black high schools in uh, New York. We started in New York with two schools, one charter school, uh, which is private, and one public school. So it's a small scale initiative, but it's really aimed at those two things we're, we're thinking. On, on pay gap, it is lessening. Our experience, particularly in the digital area, is it's lessening. And I think the primary driver of that was the, the murder of Floyd. Okay, thank you. And let's kind of almost wrap up. What are your, I mean, as Paul said in the intro, you've, you've been around a very long time. You've, you've dominated the advertising industry. Uh, don't you, don't you, make me feel that way. I mean, you're very young still, obviously. It, you, but this interview was going okay <laughs> until then. As right. a very young man, Sir Martin, yeah, yeah, that's what is your advice, three pieces of advice for any CMO here today going into an uncertain, um, uncertain year? Well, you know, the only presentation I saw was the one previously. So it, uh, actually that resonated with me. Uh, a fair bit, and, and I guess the first thing is um, everybody who will sit on this stage or any of the other five stages uh, here, however many, will say that their organizations are agile. Uh, the experience that we have with many clients who say that their organizations are agile doesn't match up, and, and probably to be fair, you know, we say our organizations are agile, and maybe the experience that some people in this room or outside it have had have not borne that out. So agility is the key thing. I mean, simple to say, and it's a bit like apple pie and motherhood, uh, but I do think it's really, really important, making the, the, comp the companies, you know, particularly with what we're going through. If you think about the compression that we've seen in the last six months, you know, we're, we're literally, if we were having this discussion on January the 1st, it will be blue sky, it's stormy now, right? And it's happened within a very, very short period of time. So agility is absolutely key, and don't just say it, do it. I mean, it, the pitch process, you know, to take even, I don't know, three months on a pitch, or six months, or nine months, or 12 months, is crazy in a world that is moving at light speed. So I would say, you know, it's much better to, to, you know, any CMO worth his or her salt will know the agencies or CIO or CDO, Chief Digital Officer or Chief Sales, will know who they like, they, they feel would be appropriate to work with. Hire two or three, run projects with them and get on with it. So that'd be one. Number two would be take back control. Uh, I mean, I... I hate to use Dominic Cummings' uh, Brexit-winning uh, line, but it's, it's germane here too. The world has changed. In an increasingly digitally dominated world, which is now two-thirds of the market, let's say, going to 75%, and will infuse everything in a short, very short period of time, you have to have more control of the content that you produce, your data, uh, your media, your analytics, and your tech services. So outsourcing mindlessly, and that may sound crazy coming from me, but outside, we have three models, outsource, embed, and in-house. Um, outsourcing it just willy-nilly. Now, ironically, because of the recession uh, slowdown in growth, we're going to see more. You know, you, we're already starting to see even tech companies start to cut back on internal headcount and start to out, outsource more. But in a, in a data-driven, iterative model of the type, the Holy Trinity type that we, call, we talk about, you've got to take that much control on your, particularly on content, and particularly on data and analytics and digital media. And then the third thing, which is much more granular, is the point that was made previously, <coughs> which is that first-party data with Google's deprecation of third-party cookies, Apple's IDFA decision, 
if you don't seamlessly integrate, and it's easy to say but very difficult to do, because companies have grown through acquisition or they've had different CIOs or CTOs or CMOs all gone in different, different directions. But if you don't integrate your first party data, which is consented consumer data, so you jump the privacy hurdle and the consent hurdle, uh, unless you use that and integrate that with the signals you get from the platforms, which are increasingly the dominant six that I mentioned before, the three Western and the three Eastern. You know, remember, Twitter and Snap are great, but their ad revenues are, Snap is at five and a half billion, and Twitter's at four and a half. And we have to see whether Elon Musk will either increase that or diminish it. So we'll see how that plays out. Google will do 230 billion this year. Facebook, uh, Meta will do 130 billion this year. Amazon will do 40 billion this year. And I, from what I heard in Cannes, ByteDance might be up even beyond Amazon now, including China. So they probably might be, they could be as high as 60 billion. So, you know, the big boys and girls are the, the six. So integrate your first party data with the signals you get from those platforms. So those will be the three things, agility, Take back control, first party day. Well, amazing advice. Let me finish bang on time and say thank you so and, much. And learn, uh, and learn code in Chinese. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So it's always an honor and a pleasure to be smart. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and, and wouldn't, wouldn't go without saying, anybody who wants to discuss anything, martin at s4capital.com. And I, he always does reply, so yeah. drop him a line. It's I'm quite always amazing. interested. There's a wolf down there on the screen. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Thank you, guys. Uh,